hyperdispensationalism, lawlessness. The command to divide the Bible found in 2 Timothy 2.15 does not eliminate the inherent complications involved in Bible study. In fact, insight into the very real dangers are found within the verse itself by the inclusion of the word rightly. The implications being that if one can rightly divide the word of truth, by default God's word can be wrongly divided too. This is true because all the books of the Bible fit together like the pieces of a puzzle. The whole cannot be properly understood without each of the pieces. Yet the pieces cannot be properly understood without the whole. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Pertaining to the church on earth today, none of the 66 books should be devalued as if it were inapplicable or extraneous material. This is certainly true in a practical sense, as indicated by the Apostle Paul when he said, Now all these things happen unto them, Old Testament saints, for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come, 1 Corinthians 10.11. In the same chapter, Paul had previously said, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they, Old Testament saints, also lusted, 1 Corinthians 10.6. No Christian can be spiritually balanced without considering the ensamples and examples that God has provided the church. While most would agree that certain Old Testament scriptures can be applied to the church as it pertains to practical help, some Bible teachers would unfortunately balk at considering that these same truths are intended to assist the New Testament believers doctrinally. Eliminating personal application of any portion of the Bible corrupts the principles of rightly dividing by pushing them outside their God-given parameters. After all, God said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. Succinctly, all scripture is profitable. While many people consider exposing the differences in the various ages within man's history as the primary function of dispensationalism, this Bible study method can hinder those desiring to receive the whole truth. Therefore, God and the scriptures oppose any method that divides God's word to the extreme, whether supposing no differences or imagining non-existent differences. True Bible students expend equal energy upon the common threads tying scripture together as they do upon those things which separate one time and people group from another. Keep in mind that when God said that all scripture is profitable, he really meant that all scripture is profitable for you. Man is to study all scripture through the lens of 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the Bible. A man who studies or applies the study Paul only principle or the Jesus only principle in the Gospels finds himself on a slippery slope that ultimately leads away from Christ, away from church, and ultimately away from the truth he seeks. Christians need to seek a balance, and those who limit Bible study to one section of the Bible to the exclusion of other portions of the scriptures hinder their spiritual growth and the spiritual growth of those whom they influence. Yet God led Paul to write, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2.7. The majority of those who err on the side of hyper-dispensationalism do so by overemphasizing Paul's epistles. It is true that God admonished the church to consider what Paul said to gain understanding of the scripture in its entirety. However, emphasizing Paul's epistles by excluding the other scripture from its proper practical and doctrinal application has proven to be extremely detrimental. In fact, this practice is the essence of hyper or ultra dispensationalism. To clarify, hyper dispensationalism can be defined as any false or unscriptural division of the Bible. In other words, it is the practice of over dividing the Bible in such a manner that much of the Bible is reduced to holding little to no real impact upon the Christian today. Generally, a person engages in hyperdispensationalism when he incorrectly forces portions of the Bible to strictly apply to individuals living in another age. This can and has been done to the Old Testament, the four Gospels, the book of Acts, Hebrews through Jude, the book of Revelation, and even some of Paul's earliest epistles. Our sincere desire is to help avoid this pitfall that has divided the brethren and produced a carnal, judgmental, know-it-all mentality amongst those who desire most to be propagators of the truth. Identifying the hyper-dispensationalist. 
Civility has generally been abandoned as the brethren hurl accusatory terminology against fellow brethren. This should not be the case. For instance, the term heretic should only be used as the scripture grants such permission and authority. Likewise, terms like legalist and hyper, this or that, should be used more cautiously. Typically, men consider a man a hyper any time he does anything one step further than the individual hurling the accusation. This practice of spewing insults toward those with whom we disagree is detrimental to the body of Christ and has harmed the testimony of many good men. At the same time, one should be capable of identifying common traits of those who are hyper-dispensationalists. A hyper-dispensationalist tends to dismiss or minimize God's grace in ages outside the present church age. The hyper-dispensationalist who identifies the present age as the age of grace, note many use this designation and are not hyper-dispensationalist. In using this label, he minimizes the grace of God in other ages, past and future, by overemphasizing the grace of God in the present age. Some even teach that the present era is the only period in which God has dealt with man through grace. There are always new methods to teach this error, with some even differentiating grace and mercy to the point of identifying the Old Testament God as a God of mercy and the church age God as a God of grace. This type of teaching lessens the integrity of the Old Testament canon of Scripture by attributing to God a false identity and also impugns God's character. This type of haphazard Bible study produces a false sense of relieving the individual of some of his responsibilities toward God and toward man. To deny the supreme role of God's grace in other periods of time is to assign to these periods a status of relative inferiority and insignificance. Some would deem this Bible degradation as blasphemous. While it is true that the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was the epitome of grace and truth, John 1.17, the exercise of God's grace began with Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis 3.21. Some preachers have reduced Bible study to plugging words or phrases into Bible study software and canonizing the results. While we thank God for the advances in technology that have allowed for such tools, word studies have become the lazy preacher's tool to quick sermon outlines and limited the grasp of the scriptures. For instance, the first time the Bible used the word grace with Noah, it occurs 1,000 years after grace was plainly manifested in the life of Adam. Genesis 6-8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The scripture plainly reveals that God offered and ministered grace to those living prior to the church age. Although it may seem elementary to make this point, grace did not originate with Paul's epistles or with the church age. Other Old Testament books also refer to the extension of God's grace. The book of Ezra, for example, refers to grace and mercy and fittingly defines both. After all, grace cannot be administered without mercy, and neither can mercy be administered without grace. The two are inseparable. Mercy is dispensed when one is punished less than he deserves. Grace is involved in the extension of that mercy. Ezra 9, 8. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Mercy. Ezra 9, 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. It is inconceivable how anyone can dismiss God's grace or his mercy during Old Testament times, but those who use the Bible to prove pet doctrines stoop to these levels. This methodology harms the church when men become enamored with teaching rather than learning from God. David is another prime example of someone under the law that received God's mercy and grace. David's sin with Bathsheba was guilty of a sin unto death, 1 John 5, 16 and 17. Yet David did not die. Why not? Because God was merciful and gracious to both David and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 12, 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. The chart on page 617 is titled Old Testament Grace. David fully anticipated the death penalty because of the law's pronouncements against his sin. In fact, according to God's law, both David and Bathsheba were to be put to death. 
yet both lived. Why did David and Bathsheba escape the demanded punishment? God's mercy and grace. Compare the outcome of David's sin with the punishment prescribed for adultery under the letter of the law, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Keep in mind that no adequate animal sacrifice to extend their lives existed to atone for David and Bathsheba's sins of adultery and murder, Deuteronomy 30, 19. Leviticus 20, 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. Even with just these few examples, we see that Noah, the nation of Israel in Ezra's day, and David all found grace in the Old Testament. Thus, the Bible clearly indicates that God's grace not only existed under the law, but also predated the law. The theme of grace runs throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, not a single soul could ever or will ever enter heaven except by the grace of God. There are absolutely no exceptions to this rule. From Adam, throughout the end of time, none. A hyper-dispensationalist tends to discount the law's application to the church age. From Adam to Christ, over 4,000 years of human history transpired. The first 2,000 years came and went before Genesis chapter 10 and majored on the lives of two men, Adam and Noah. Interestingly, the law of Moses, while spanning most of the Old Testament books, only covered approximately a 1,500-year period prior to the incarnation of Christ, with 400 of those years being included in the time between Testaments known as the 400 years of silence. Establishing the Law The role and purpose of the law in the present age confuses many believers and non-believers alike. Since the law was given to the children of Israel, many believe it has very little or no application to the body of Christ. This same mindset incorrectly concludes that grace and law are incompatible. Because of this philosophy, much clear-cut guidance from God's Word is ignored, and many of the Old Testament examples are relegated to irrelevancy. This way of thinking astounds those who come to recognize the unity of Scripture. After all, if the law's usefulness passed, would it not be void? However, to consider the law void would contradict God's Word as given to the Apostle Paul. Paul asks and answers the fundamental question concerning the law's function today. Romans 3.31 Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. According to Paul, we establish the law. By definition, to establish means to make firm, to confirm, to ratify that which has been previously set or made. Since we establish the law, why do so many Christians ignore its personal application to their lives? Christians ignore the law because they have been taught that the Lord Jesus Christ, or the age of grace, voided the many facets of the law. To be void means to have no legal or binding force. Granted, we are not under the law, Romans 6.14, but this does not mean that the church makes the law void. With these two definitions in mind, reconsider the preceding verse. The Bible says that the body of Christ establishes the law. However, hyperdispensationalists generally want no law established, desire no rules for living, and oppose any attempt to present the truth concerning application of the law to a Christian's daily walk with God. These individuals consider the law to be outdated and obsolete. The hyperdispensationalist reaction to the law appears to be more rooted in their hidden agenda than in a sincere search for truth. They desire to avoid the law's explicit guidance and convicting properties. When a person teaches that the law is inapplicable today, he is forced to ignore, change, or spiritualize many of Paul's clear statements concerning the law. Consider, for instance, 1 Timothy 1.8, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. The Apostle Paul wrote, The law is good and still has a lawful or proper use during the church age. Out of ignorance or fear, we have far too much preaching which ignores the law when we really need preaching that reveals how to use the law lawfully. This would seem to be what Paul alluded to in his remarks about not shunning any of God's counsel. Acts 20:27. 20, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Two major reasons Two major reasons far too many Christians lack a resolve to live a godly lifestyle both emerge from perverted use of the law. Frequently one of the two extremes dominates most Bible-believing churches. There is either the lack of preaching and teaching of the law altogether, resulting in carnality, or there is the unlawful application of the law by those who preach and enforce parts of it to lord over God's heritage. 1 Peter 5.2 Feed the flock of God which is among you, 
taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Ignoring the law in its proper application often produces a carnal Christianity amongst believers. However, over-application of the law tends to produce weak Christians dependent upon the letter of the law as given by the authority figures to take the place of the Spirit's inner guidance. Regardless of the extremes taken, the results are detrimental. Biblical Christianity seeks the balance between the complete rejection of the law and spiritual legalism. The chart on page 620 is titled, Establishing the Law. Bible-believing Christians always desire to be scripturally balanced in every area. We know that we do not make the law void, but rather we establish it, Romans 3.31. At the same time, the scripture plainly states that believers are not under the law, Galatians 5.18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Bible believers recognize that the Bible contains no contradictions. Therefore, there must be a consistent application of these two passages that determines the God-intended balance. That balance can only be grasped when one learns that the purpose of the law is changed, at least as it pertains to its application for the Christian. After all, we know for certain that believers are not under the law, Romans six fourteen through 15 Galatians 3.23, Galatians 4.21, and Galatians 5.18, in the same sense that Israel was under the law. Prior to the cross, if a man fulfilled the requirements under the law, he would possess a temporal righteousness. The following verses are a sampling of this truth found throughout the Old Testament, even during the Babylonian captivity recorded in Ezekiel. 1 Kings 8.32 then hear thou in heaven, and do, and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked, to bring his way upon his head, and justifying the righteous, to give him according to his righteousness. Second Chronicles 6.23 Then hear thou from heaven, and do, and judge thy servants, by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head, and by justifying the righteous, by giving him according to his righteousness. Psalm 1.5, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Ezekiel 18.24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned in them shall he die however if a person sinned and did not fulfill the necessary sacrifices he could have his life shortened and the lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the lord our god for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day deuteronomy 6:24 Paul referred to this righteousness, which is of the law, as one's own righteousness. Philippians 3, 9, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. In the 1500 years that Israel was under the law prior to Christ's incarnation, not one Jew or Gentile ever kept the law in its entirety. In preparation for failure, the required course of action for sin was also clearly defined. A person's temporal righteousness under the law could have been established by keeping the statutes of the law or reestablished by providing the necessary sacrifices when the individual failed in any area. Yet there is much more chronicled throughout the Old Testament. Concerning salvation, Paul contrasts a man's righteousness with God's righteousness because establishing a man's righteousness was only a temporary life preserver, not something that a man could trust to save his soul. Don't miss that. Romans 10.1 Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Only about 1,100 years of the 1,500 years on the law was recorded in the Old Testament historical accounts prior to Christ's arrival. Interestingly, there were various gaps of time where Israel was incapable of keeping the law either because of captivity or the lack of a tabernacle or temple in which to worship and sacrifice. Yet Ezekiel and Jeremiah show 
that an Israelite could still be righteous during these spaces of time. If righteousness came by the works of the law, Israel needed those works to be righteous. Yet the Lord criticized Israel because they sought the law of righteousness through the works of the law. Romans 9.31 But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Consider this real life example to better understand righteousness under the law. CPAs, that is Certified Public Accountants, file federal income tax forms. If a CPA files a federal income tax form incorrectly, he breaks the law. If he did not file the corrected forms, he would be guilty of breaking the law and could be punished accordingly. However, a timely amended return would bring him back into conformity with the law. God's law worked much the same way. The sacrifices work like the amended return function for the CPA. A righteous person under the law was not an individual who had never broken the law. Rather, a righteous person under the law was the individual who offered the required sacrifices to cover over his sin after breaking the law. Those who fulfilled the law were not the ones who never broke it, but were those who offered the required sacrifices in repentance for their indiscretions. However, it must again be noted that the individual's temporal righteousness was never sufficient to gain him entrance into heaven, nor was it sufficient to get him into Abraham's bosom, that is, paradise. Only the righteousness obtained by faith could get anyone into Abraham's bosom, and only the blood of Jesus Christ could sufficiently atone for sin in such a way as to gain the individual entrance into heaven. Ultimately, Christ died for all sin, including those under the First Testament, Hebrews 9.15. With this in mind, if anyone could earn God's righteousness that granted spiritual and eternal life by keeping the law, Christ died in vain. Paul succinctly states this truth, Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Paul further warned that anyone seeking to establish his or her own righteousness by fulfilling the law and as a means of justification was lost and will remain lost forever. To be saved, one must receive the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ on his behalf, 2 Corinthians 5.21. When a man receives Christ's righteousness, he becomes righteous in God's eyes, having all sins forgiven. Even if a person could keep the entire law and no one can or could, works play no part in his salvation. After all, we are not justified by the law and no flesh ever could be. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Simply, the law cannot and could never justify a man in the sight of God. Consequently, and yet erroneously, some have concluded that the law lacks significance in the lives of Christians today. The Word of God today is likened to the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16, and likewise the Word of God in the Old Testament was likened to the mind of the Lord. Here is one such example, Leviticus 24.12, and they put him in ward that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. Plainly, the law simply depicts God's thoughts, his leanings, and his biases on issues that plagued man in the past, many of which continue to plague man today. After Christ's death, the Jews rejected Christ's sacrifice by trying to establish their own righteousness through the law. Paul plainly indicated that neither they, Israel, nor anyone else could establish God's righteousness by keeping the statutes of the law. The necessary righteousness in the sight of God only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, only through the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Lord Jesus Christ was the end of the law for righteousness. Attempting to keep the works and the sacrifice of the law to be righteous and acceptable to God makes one a rebel to God's plan and purpose. Concerning righteousness, Christ's faithfulness counts, not ours. His work matters, not ours. The Christian's faithfulness and work only become important following salvation. Many verses, including Ephesians 2.10 and Titus 3.8, clearly proclaim that the Christian should do good works following salvation. However, any lost person seeking to establish a righteousness that can save will end up in hell. The chart on page 624 is titled, The Law and Righteousness, Our Walk in God's Law. The law plays no part in a person's salvation today except as a schoolmaster to make the lost person conscious of his sinful condition. 
Galatians 3, 24 and 25. Yet Christians should determine how the law should affect one's walk with God and interaction with his fellow man. According to the epistles of Paul, the law is directly linked to the love we are to have one toward another. Sadly, in our zeal for truth, we tend to neglect that God also called us to be servants to others. Here's a practical application of these principles. When considering any action, ask yourself the following three questions. Number one, are my motives of God or of Satan? Number two, will my actions please my Savior or my flesh? And then number three, will my testimony be enhanced or be diminished? Each of these questions, either directly or indirectly, deals with how readily the Christian places others before himself. Simply put, an individual's answers to these questions indicate whether he obediently loves others as scripturally mandated by God. This love toward others does not simply refer to the sentimental love of the televangelists and Christian psychiatrists and psychologists. It refers to the love of the Bible, which is the fulfillment of the law. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. A Christian's lack of concern for others will be reflected by his walk and testimony. Since a person's walk best demonstrates his love for others, his testimony serves the best evidence of his love. Be sure to grasp these two interconnected truths. The key to the law is to love your neighbor. The key to fulfilling the law is to avoid walking after the flesh, but instead choosing to walk after the Spirit. Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans obviously teaches that those Christians walking after the Spirit, not after the flesh, can fulfill the righteousness of the law. This is true because Christians walking after the flesh cannot love others as God and His law instructs. Walking after the flesh adversely affects so many areas of one's life. For instance, the Christian walking after the flesh will not witness as he should. He will not submit to God's authority, and his overall testimony before others will be adversely affected. One cannot simultaneously serve one's flesh and serve others. The Purpose of the Law Additionally, the purpose of the law has changed. Under the Old Testament, the law was divided into two parts. The law is dealing with man's relationship with God, and the law is dealing with man's relationship with man. In the end, both affected each other, but the priority was man's relationship with God. The main purpose of the law was to affect the Jews' relationship with God. Historically, the Jews attempted to keep the law to keep sin out of the camp so that God might dwell between the cherubims in their midst. Today, God dwells within every believer with a promise never to depart the believer. Thus, the benefits of the law cannot involve God dwelling in our midst, but rather our relationship with others. This is evident in the next passage as God set forth that a person's submission to God's laws displays his obedience to the duty of loving others. Verse 8 states the foundational principle, fulfilling the law through love toward one another. Romans 13, 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this... Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Since the Apostle Paul quoted directly from thou shalt nots of the law, it should be evident that one cannot simply dismiss the law as inapplicable to Christianity. Furthermore, Paul repeatedly stated that loving others fulfills the law. This means that when Christians do the actions of Romans 13, 9, we fulfill the law. A Christian does not commit adultery, kill, steal, lie, and covet because of his love for others, not just for his relationship to God. Read the passage again carefully. What part does loving others play in man's walk with God? Love of others is the fulfilling of the law, verse 8, and because of our love toward others, for this, because you want to fulfill the law, thou shalt not, verse 9. Verse 10 offers a great summary of the matter by stating that fulfilling the law is working no ill toward one's neighbor. The purpose of considering any application of the law to the church is not to become worthy of God's presence in our midst, but to understand how to love one another. Thus, those who reject application of the law to the church body 
in this manner generally struggle the most with how to treat others the way God intended for them to be treated. This is one of the primary reasons Christians have become so uncivil toward others with whom they disagree, much like the world has lost its civility toward those who disagree with them. Those who display a lack of love toward others generally are clueless how the law is to impact their relationships. Many dispensationalists reading this may balk at the idea of applying any aspects of the law to the church. After all, many of the most vocal brethren have claimed that we need to rightly divide the law by relegating it to the people of the past. There are those who teach that the entire law was Jewish and God is dealing with and through the church today. They claim that the law has been done away in Christ and we are completely and entirely governed by grace. This is especially true since portions of the law can be shown as contrary to God's instructions to the church. Yet it must be understood that God's grace teaches us how to live in this present world. The grace of God teaches Christians to live soberly, righteously, and godly. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Thus the conundrum on how to apply any part of the law when we are under grace. Thankfully, God never leaves man without the enlightenment necessary to know what to do. We are to use the law only as it lines up with the revelation given to the church. The clearest explanation comes from the following passage. 1 Timothy 1.8 But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. The middle verses, verses 9 and 10, list the persons for whom God made the law for sinners. Yet these verses are a parenthetical thought with the main theme of the passage communicated in verses 8 and 11. To more clearly understand the concept God conveyed, we must read verses 8 and 11 together. The law is good if a man use it lawfully, verse 8, according to the gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, verse 11. The law is supposed to be used as it pertains to the revelation given to the church. For this reason, a good portion of the law is not refuted by Paul and the other apostles in their writings, but actually confirmed, or as Paul wrote, established. Page 628, the chart is titled, Using the Law Lawfully. This is the end of chapter 42. Sensationalism abolished ordinances. The ordinances abolished or blotted out. As already established, considering what Paul wrote about the law enables the individual Christian to comprehend the role of God's law today. Another important aspect of the law concerning the Old Testament versus the New Testament ordinances. Paul addressed the ordinances both old and new. Ephesians 2.13 Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. According to this passage, the Lord abolished something. Yet what is it that the Lord abolished? Some read this passage and try to apply it to the law, but the passage refers to the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Nowhere does the Bible tell the church that the law, all-inclusive, has been abolished or ended. Instead, one will find that Christ abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. The ordinances under the law include Sabbath days, holy days, special meats, drinks, circumcision, etc. Paul reiterates this point again in Colossians. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled all principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. The Old Testament ordinances were blotted out when Christ died. As such, in the church age, there is no law against eating pork or catfish. 
There is no law establishing the observance of Sabbath or holy days. Anyone who tries to put a person under the ordinances of the law is a hypocrite and gives heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. These doctrines of devils include not only ordinances concerning meats, but also forbidding marriage for religious purposes. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Although many religious organizations ignore this passage, God says it is a doctrine of devils for someone to forbid marriage or to command to abstain from meats for religious purposes. Those who teach or practice such things in the church age have given heed to seducing spirits. Yet at the same time, the ordinances of the law have been replaced by ordinances tailored to the church. The book of 1 Corinthians clarifies God's position for determining the ordinances of the church. Keep the ordinances as I, Paul in the context, Deliver them to you. First Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11.1 Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Despite all this biblical evidence for a balanced view of the law, those accustomed to having Christianity their way will cry out that the law serves one purpose, squashing their liberty. The question directed toward those making such pronouncements is whether they will ever read what the Bible truly says about one's liberty in Christ. Have you ever read what the Bible warns against concerning a return to bondage? These libertarians may be in for quite a surprise from the scriptures. On page 631, the chart is titled, Keep the Right Ordinances. What is bondage? Only a Bible rejecter ignores the plain truths of scripture. Paul made known the ordinances to be observed by the church and explained that the ordinances under the law were nailed to the cross. He also offered instructions concerning the law and its application. While some may balk at the idea and suggest that our newfound liberty in Christ makes us free from the law, consider what God actually taught in Paul's epistles. We have been called into liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another, Galatians 5.13. The Bible says that we are to use our liberty to serve one another. Simply stated, Christian liberty is not liberty for the flesh to thrive, but liberty from the flesh so that it can be put into submission. As such, Christians still have a responsibility to live right in the eyes of God and the eyes of man. Churches and preachers who teach that Christians should not drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco, vape, get tattoos, or be polluted by the television or internet are not robbing their congregations of liberties by putting them under bondage. Parents and teachers who warn against inappropriate clothing and suggest boundaries in male-female relationships are not doing away with the Christian's rights in Christ. Instead, they are sounding a much-needed alarm which Christians should hear and heed. When a believer willingly submits to the Spirit of God and follows the truths set forth in the New Testament epistles, he can easily understand which parts of the law apply to his life and walk. However, there are many individuals who remain confused about the application of the law to their lives and conclude that Paul defines bondage as being placed in the submission to the law. Paul used the concept of bondage in reference to being placed in submission to the ordinances under the law. The book of Galatians gives us further insight into this truth. Galatians 2.4 And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. The false brethren mentioned in the preceding verse were attempting to bring believers into submission to their ordinances under the law. Galatians chapter 4 provides further insight into this situation. Obviously, observing days, that is, holy days, Sabbath days, etc., places a person under the bondage of the law. Galatians 4, 9. But now, after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? The definition of bondage is found in the next verse. Ye observe days and months and times and years. These are the ordinances under the law. Still not clear? God knows that our flesh would rather reject the truth. Therefore, God indulges us with another example, but only to make our ungodliness more evident to prove how much we really long to reject the truth. Our rejection usually stems from the fact that we believe our ideas superior to the truths that God sets forth. 
change minds are a sign of spirituality, attempting to change the scriptures inspired by the flesh and the devil. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. The scripture is clear. The bondage warned against in the above passage involves circumcision and those seeking justification through circumcision. Paul admonished these individuals to stand fast in their liberty, remain firm in their conviction. Obviously, circumcision was one of the ordinances of the law. These men were directing others to be circumcised to be justified. However, Paul explains that keeping the Old Testament ordinances of circumcision made a person a debtor to do the whole law. Verse 3. The topic most closely related to bondage is liberty. After all, bondage involves being overcome by someone or something, 2 Peter 2.19, while liberty is the freedom from the flesh and any other hindrance to living a godly life, one pleasing to the Savior. Biblical liberty is not a license to sin. While our flesh wishes that liberty was complete freedom from any kind of rules or standards for living, the Bible does not define liberty in this manner. The flesh hates any application of restraint placed upon it, especially by something as restrictive as God's word. Yet liberty is not an exclusion from the rule of law. For example, 1 Corinthians 10.28 but if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? In the above passage, Paul explained that a man should not exercise his God-given liberty to eat, all he received with thanksgiving, 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, if eating would destroy a brother's weak conscience. Why? Because exercising one's right to eat breaks another of God's precepts to love one another. Loving one another was more important than exercising liberty to eat whatsoever one desires. Paul did not simply explain how we are to live. He lived the example for us to follow. His example put others first. This also shows another example of Paul's use of liberty. The chart on page 634 is titled, Old Testament Ordinances Bring Bondage. 1 Corinthians 8.8 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren, wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend." 1 Corinthians falls within Paul's missionary epistles. During that period, Paul was ministering to a large number of Jews. Although he had rights due to his newfound faith in Christ, exercising his right to eat paled in comparison to his responsibility to love his brother. As such, Paul promised that he would rather eat no meat so long as the world stood if doing so caused his brother to stumble. One who is a true hyper-dispensationalist will spiritualize dispensationalize and pervert this truth to make it apply to someone else in some other time and not to himself today. Too many Christians that come to understand their rights fail to understand their corresponding responsibilities. For example, Paul asked the carnal Christians at Corinth why they felt compelled to put their rights before their love and concern for others. 1 Corinthians 6, 7, Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? The Old Testament was written for the church age saints' learning, giving us examples and examples to consider. Yet some obstinate Bible students still fail to heed these scriptural admonitions. Even with these truths repeatedly stated, the Bible rejectors will refuse to acknowledge that the entire Bible has some type of application to the church today. They do so under the guise of living on a higher spiritual plane and authority, suggesting that it opposes Paul's epistles. However, Paul wrote that the revelation of the mystery, 
now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, Romans 16, 25, and 26. As God's Spirit does His work, the scriptures of the prophets manifest the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Additionally, Paul pointed to the holy scriptures known by Timothy since childhood. They were able to make thee wise unto salvation, 2 Timothy 3.15. This truth reinforces the fact that the law found in the Old Testament is man's schoolmaster, Galatians 3.24, to bring him unto Christ. The law cannot bring salvation, but as the schoolmaster it brings to light the unregenerate state of man without Christ. The schoolmaster identifies man's utter hopelessness to attain salvation. Then the gospel, the grace of God, offers the solution to this hopelessness by pointing the sinner to Christ and his sacrificial death. Thank the Lord for his law that convicts of sin and for the Savior who forgives all who come to him. A hyperdispensationalist tends to exclude everyone except for Paul's role in the church age. Not only does the hyperdispensationalist minimize God's graciousness in other ages and the application of previous truths in the present age, but he also tends to over-exaggerate God's emphasis upon Paul's ministry in the present age. To the hyperdispensationalist, everything becomes about what Paul said to the neglect of the remainder of Scripture. In fact, some have said that Paul should get the preeminence, Colossians 1.8. Interestingly, the progression into hyperdispensationalism gradually spirals out of control when the healthy appreciation for Paul's writings turns into an exaltation of the man. Everyone in the body of Christ should appreciate Paul's position within the body of believers, but this should not spawn a rejection of many fundamental truths foundational to the Christian faith, Hebrews 10.25. While the man who rejects dispensationalism errs because he assumes all 66 books of the Bible and most every portion therein applies to him, the hyperdispensationalist errs in focusing only upon Paul's 14 epistles if he believes Paul wrote Hebrews, or 13 of Paul's epistles if he believes Paul did not write Hebrews, or seven of Paul's epistles if he believes only Paul's non-missionary epistles are binding today. These hyperdispensationalists mutilate the Bible so that there is little left for the admonition of the believer. While it is true that a person should recognize the division between Paul's writings and other portions of God's word between Paul's missionary epistles and his prison epistles, these divisions have become excessively divisive amongst the brethren who take their eyes off of Christ. When Paul admonished believers to consider what he said, he meant to consider it all, 2 Timothy 2.7. And by default, that could not mean considering his writings to the exclusion of the rest of the Bible. God never led Paul to eliminate the need for other portions of Scripture, nor did Paul ever eliminate or minimize the importance of his earliest epistles. As proof, consider these general statements by Paul concerning the Old Testament. Romans 15.4 for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. 1 Corinthians 10.6 Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Verse 1, the fathers. Verse 2, Moses. 1 Corinthians 10.11 Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. A hyperdispensationalist eliminates too much of the Bible from the Christian spiritual arsenal. Number one, to the hyperdispensationalist, the Old Testament becomes null and void because it preceded the incarnation of Christ. Number two, to the hyperdispensationalist, the Gospels are no longer binding because they perceive the finished work of Christ on the cross and the revelation of the mystery. Number three, to the hyperdispensationalist, the book of Acts is inapplicable because it is an historical and transitional book. Number four, to the hyperdispensationalists, the books of Hebrews through Revelation do not apply because they are supposedly future and apply only to Daniel's 70th week with a different mode of salvation which includes works. Number five, to the hyperdispensationalists, some of Paul's earliest epistles, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians, do not apply because of their heavy Jewish influence. Number six, to the hyperdispensationalists, all scripture is not given for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. And number seven, to the hyperdispensationalist, all scripture is not profitable, 2 Timothy 3.16. The results of hyperdividing are easily identifiable. 
they have brought Bible-believing Christian churches to their knees in confusion. For instance, according to the hyper-dispensationalists, the exhortation to attend church applies to Daniel's seventh week and not to the church-age saint because Hebrews is not for the church-age. Something not for you, but meant for someone else during some other time has a lot less propensity to convict. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Ever wonder why so many faithfully attending church members now find more important matters on Sunday morning and evening along with the midweek service nights? These Bible students have been hyper-divided right out of their conviction for faithful church attendance because God's admonition to them really is intended for those fleeing the beast during Daniel's 70th week. According to many of the hyper-dispensationalists, water baptism is not for the church age because it is mentioned in the Gospels for Jews and in the book of Acts, transitional book, and Paul only mentioned it in his missionary epistles, 1 Corinthians 1, 14-16. These epistles and that doctrine, according to the hypers, were phased out when Paul received the revelation of the mystery in prison. These hypers apply this same philosophy to the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 34, and the giving to the work of God, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and 2 Corinthians 9, 7. If this same line of thinking were applied consistently, hell and the virgin birth could be phased out since Paul's epistles never mentioned them once. Before suggesting that this is mere mockery, check it out for yourself. Hyperdispensationalism is a slippery slope that ends with a man out of church, out of fellowship with God's people, and ultimately out of fellowship with God himself. A hyperdispensationalist tends to move the start of the church into the middle portion of the book of Acts, directly tying it to Paul's salvation and ministry. The issue concerning the timing of the church's origin is one of the most sought-after answers by dispensational students and believers in general. Did the church, which is Christ's body, Colossians 1, 18 and verse 24, begin prior to or following Paul's conversion to Christianity in Acts chapter 9? Surprisingly, the answer to this question is easily grasped through a basic understanding of the scriptures which follow. After studying the biblical indications delineated below, it is inconceivable how anyone with even a superficial grasp of the Bible could claim that the church began at any point after Paul's conversion. In fact, Paul repeatedly wrote that he persecuted the already existing church, Philippians 3, 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous which is of the law, blameless. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Galatians 1, 13, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Could Paul persecute something not yet in existence? All of Paul's persecution of the church of God took place prior to Acts chapter 9 when Paul was gloriously saved. If the church began with Paul, how could he have persecuted an entity not yet in existence? Obviously, the church began prior to Paul's conversion because he persecuted the entity that Jesus said that he would build. Obviously, the church that Jesus mentioned he would build is the one that Paul persecuted. Matthew sixteen eighteen, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus did not say that he would build his churches, one being a Jewish church and the other being a Gentile church, as we will see, the church that Jesus promised to build contains both Jews and Gentiles within the same body. Jesus built only one church, and this is the same one that Paul persecuted. Paul not only admitted to persecuting that church, but also proclaimed that he began preaching the same faith that he once attempted to eradicate. Galatians 1.23 but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Paul persecuted the church. Paul preached the faith he once ambitiously worked to exterminate. Those two proofs seem like insurmountable obstacles for anyone to twist, but God offers even more proof. Since Jesus is the head of his church, which is his body, Paul's persecution toward the believers was effectively directed toward Jesus, even if Paul jailed, tortured, and killed believers. Acts 9, 5, And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. When Paul persecuted the church, that is, the members, the Lord testified to Paul that he was persecuting Jesus Christ, 
who presently sat at the right hand of the Father. The only means whereby this could be true is that the believers had to be in Christ. Otherwise, Paul could not have been persecuting Jesus. If the body of Christ, the church, began with Paul, why would Paul repeatedly state that there were others in Christ before him? Romans 12, 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, etc. For instance, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me, Romans 16, 7. A person in Christ is a member of the body of Christ, a saved child of God. This is further proof that Christ's church, or his body, did not begin with the Apostle Paul. Many hyper- or ultra-dispensationalists never carefully read the definition of the mystery of Christ. It involves Gentiles joining their Jewish brethren already in the body. Redeemed Gentiles become fellow heirs with the Jews, and not the other way around. The body of Christ started with Jews, not the Apostle to the Gentiles. Ephesians 3, 4, Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Praise God that the Gentiles can now become heirs with the Jews in the same body simply by trusting in Christ. This is the mystery that had been kept secret since the world began. In fact, the Bible refers to the Gentiles having been grafted in among the Jews who were already in that body. Romans 11:13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of Gentiles, I magnify mine office. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Romans chapter 11 clearly depicts how the Jews as a nation were spiritually broken off and how the Gentiles were surgically brought into a place of blessing. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul developed the truth further by articulating the utter hopelessness of Gentiles prior to this time. The hope of the Gentiles came from realizing that the wall separating them from God was broken down by Jesus who made one new man with Jew and Gentile together. Ephesians 2.13 but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Christ made one new body through the cross. Now both Jew and Gentile have equal access to God. Paul continued the thought later in the same chapter by emphasizing that the Gentiles were no longer strangers and foreigners. Ephesians 2.19 now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. This building that Paul was adding to consisted of a defined foundation and the chief cornerstone. The apostles and prophets were the foundation with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone of that foundation. These scripture references should convince the most ardent skeptic that the body of Christ must have existed before the apostle to the Gentiles was even saved. Only those who elevate Paul's position to an inappropriate degree would teach that the body of Christ began with him. The evidence of Scripture clearly and repeatedly proves otherwise. We should all love Bible study, but those who eliminate all context will find that their Bible study becomes counterproductive and even destructive. This is the end of chapter 43.